Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. this morning. I know last week we said that we were going to end uh, this series, Growing in Maturity, but I got to be honest with you, uh, about three weeks ago I was in prayer and I began asking the Lord as we were getting ready for a new series um, and, and God just kept saying, You're, we're not done, we're not done. And, and so I, I'm just going to tell you, I'm, we're, we're going to move on in Growing into Maturity one more week because as you know, over the last couple of weeks, Jake did an incredible job, or as somebody told him last week, his, his message last week was dope. Is that what you said, Jake? Um, so uh, uh, it was dope. Uh, somebody way cooler than me can use that word because uh, I can't use that word because I'm just not cool. I think once you reach a certain age, you, anyway. Um, and he did a great job on that. But here, here's what I was sitting here looking at. As we look at John chapter 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16, the, there is a prayer that takes place in John chapter 17 that I, I don't want you to miss because I think it ties back into everything that Jesus was talking about because the whole point of this series, the whole point of growing into maturity is to get us back to the gospel, that the gospel is good news, that Jesus changes our life. Exactly. Silence. When did the gospel, when did the good news become something that we all know, but we're not passionate about? <laughs> and that's what's been on my heart over the last few weeks. Because I want people to be passionate about the gospel. What it means to grow in the good news. You see, the problem with putting an acrostic up on the screen is for many of us, we are really good legalists. I, I am a good legalist because what I will do is I'll take that list and I'll check it off. Anybody else? I'll check it off. And it was never meant to be a checklist. It was never meant, it was meant for us to experience the power of the gospel. That Jesus came to embrace what it means to be a Christ follower. And we said in the very beginning that if we line 10 people up and we ask them, hey, what does it mean to be mature? What does it mean to grow in maturity? You'd get 10 different answers, but kind of along in the same vein, you would hear some of the same things. And, and many times what it happens when you start talking about maturity, it becomes a theological discussion. It becomes a technical discussion. And here's what I know. Relationships are not meant to be technical right? Think about your marriage. There's not a technical part to your marriage because it's a relationship, right? Now, if you go home and start dictating to your spouse what they're going to do, let me know how that goes. We have an on-staff counselor, amen? 
because relationships are not meant to be technical. Now, we know intuitively, we know that relationship has responsibility, that relationship, we have a responsibility to love her, to serve him, to, to, to love him, and to maybe do your part in the relationship. But there's, the relationship should never become technical because the principles of relationships, when we boil down the relationship to technicalities, we lose the power of the gospel. We lose the power of what Jesus did. When it all comes down to a checklist, see when the gospel becomes a technical conversation about what God did, instead of why he did it, we end up with all these belief systems and a very cold hearts. When we boil it down to go check, 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 it was never meant that. That's the scary thing of putting up a checklist or an acrostic because there's something in us that we wanna make it technical. You see, the gospel was more than, than promising us life after death. And many of you grew up in a, in a denomination or in a church that taught you that the gospel was simply going to change your eternal destination, but they never taught you that the gospel not only does that, but the gospel changes your everyday living. It changes everything. You see, as we get back to the gospel, back to the power of God, we all know that God's power always has a purpose. God's power always has a purpose. In fact, in the Old Testament, we find that when God acted in power, it was to save his people Israel. Y'all remember that? The Red Sea, Moses, they come to the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. God rescues them. Incredible power on Mount Carmel when Elijah prayed and he's surrounded by all those demon worshipers and, and he prays and he calls down fire from heaven. And not only does it consume the altar, it burns all the rocks up and this incredible power because God was doing it so that people may believe in him. God's power always has a purpose. It's no different when it comes to the truth of the gospel that Jesus came, that the power of God is for the salvation of all of mankind, not just us, but for everybody out there that God wants to save us. And all that Jesus did and said was so that men would believe Remember we said that in the, in the first few weeks of this series that everything Jesus did is so that people would believe in the Father. That's why he said nothing but what the Father told him. He imitated his Father and we're to imitate him. That he was on display. And listen to me, church. You and I are on display to show the power of God and that he can change our life now, not just in eternity. The gospel is so much more than just changing your eternal address. And listen, I don't make light of that. That's awesome, amen? But it's for now. You see, God so loved the world. Why? Because God is love. Not, not that he's loving and not that he love, it just acts in loving ways. No, God is all love. That's who he is. His nature and being is the very substance of love. And to know God is to know love. And listen, for love to truly be love, there has to be an object of which the love is bestowed upon. I believe that's why God created us because he wanted to be in relationship with us. That God had envisioned to be in relationship with his creation. I believe that's why he also redeemed us through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ because he is love and his desire is for us to delight in a relationship with him. I think we forget just how incredibly powerful the gospel is, that it was all about us being in relationship with God. It was all about God pursuing us. <laughs> but therein lies the problem, doesn't it? Because for many of us, the manifestation of that divine love is obscured because of personal failures, because of hurtful relationships, because of just life's disappointments, amen? And perhaps you've agreed with those lies of the enemy that's whispered to you to defy or deny God or deny that he's good or deny his loving nature. You see, if the enemy is able to convince us that God's nature is different than it actually is, then we find ourselves in a sabotaged relationship in which we never actually know God intimately or worse, we, we, we don't even have the desire to know him. And the enemy is whispering to us, taking away the power of the gospel and basically saying that God doesn't love you. And yet we see in scripture that it was God's idea to be in relationship with us. 
You see, without an accurate understanding of how incredibly God loves us, we, 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 we're not able to have an authentic encounter with his saving power resulting in a transformed and abundant life. And listen, God can't change. He hasn't changed. The enemy's whispering in your ear that he's not the same. Listen, God's the same. And so we can reasonably conclude that God is still pursuing intimacy with mankind. Just as he did in the garden when Adam and Eve were created and he pursued them every evening. And even after they sinned, God still pursued them. If God doesn't change and he's still pursuing us today, amen? That's the power of the gospel. And God's coming at us. That beautiful, uninhibited relationship between God and man that was lost in the garden has been restored through Jesus Christ. That's what we call the gospel. That when Adam and Eve ate of that fruit and the knowledge of good and evil and it separated them, that God made a way that we could be in relationship with them through Jesus. He demonstrated the passion of Christ. He demonstrated to us the cross, and that continues today. In fact, I would say the reason some of you are here this morning is because God's pursuing you. You may think you're here because your wife has badgered you all week. You may think you're here because it, you're being good. Listen, the reason you're here, I believe, is God is pursuing you because he wants a relationship with you because he loves you. That's the gospel. That's what changes he desires to be in a relationship with you, a thriving, ongoing father-son, father-daughter, healthy relationship. You see, I believe he'll show you his son, Jesus, who for our sake became sin, who for our sake became sin so that you and I could become the righteousness of God, that you and I could be made right with God based on what he did. And that's why we've been preaching this. We've been preaching this growing in maturity because we want you to understand your righteousness is not your own. Your righteousness is realizing that you are dead to self and because you are dead to self, you've been made alive in Jesus Christ. You've been made righteous. That if we continually to yield to his passion, his death, his resurrection, his pursuit to know us, his divine power will carry us all the days of our lives. It's not for something out there, it's for now. The gospel is for now. And perhaps one of the things I struggle with in our day is that many of us have become numb to the gospel. We've become numb to the fact that we've been made righteous, that we are no longer under the power of sin. Do you, let me say that. You are no longer under the power of sin because you've been made righteous. I'm telling you, I told the elders this last Wednesday night, I struggle preaching on one Sunday and then having to wait seven days to preach again. I don't know if that's amen because you're glad or amen. <laughs> you see, one of the things that pushes me and drives me is I want you to know and to believe correctly that you are righteous and you no longer have to live under the power of sin that we can speak the truths that we're discussing this morning. And yet for many of us, there's just no conviction. We know grace, we know the gospel, we know the right answers, but there's nothing in them, the joy and the peace and that's limited because some of you still believe you're at odds with God. Some of you still believe that the effects of sin in your life has somehow alienated you from God. And yet we know by the work of Jesus Christ that we have been declared righteous in him and that we're no longer at odds with the Father. That was the power of the cross. The promise of living in eternity with our creator, free from the effects of sins permanently by the spirit and the son of God is incredible. But listen to me. I submit to you that the bottom line of the gospel is union with Christ. The bottom line of the gospel is not just your eternity. It's the fact that we would be one with Jesus Christ. Look at John chapter 17 and I'll show you. In John chapter 17, verse 1, after Jesus has gone through all this teaching and he's gotten them ready and he's, he's told these guys, this is what it looks like. He's now entered into a time of closing prayer. You ready? After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and he prayed, Father, the hour has come, talking about it's time for him to go to the cross. Glorify your son, that your son may glorify you. 
For you granted him authority over all people that he might give eternal life to all those who those you have given him. Now, this is eternal life. You ready for this? Look at it. That they know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Do you see anything there about eternity? Amen. Now look at this. That's a part of it. This is eternal life, that you would know the one true God, that you would be one with him and one with Christ. That's the gospel. <laughs> Jesus is proclaiming that all that he has shared with the disciples in those final hours, the goal, the reason is that we would know him, be intimate with him, in a relationship with him, surrender to him. Paul said the same thing in Ephesians 1. Look at it. It says in Ephesians 1, 7 through 10, in him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Look at verse 9. He made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. You see, Paul says redemption and forgiveness were given to us in an abundance of grace and that lavish kindness of God is his way of revealing to us the purpose or the motive of God behind everything that Christ did. That that mystery is now known is that God wants oneness. He wants union. He wants intimacy with us. And he did that through Jesus. The heartbeat and the rhythm of the good news is that God wants to be one with us. Listen, if we don't start and end with God's all-consuming desire to be intimate with us as people, then we're missing the entire point. Some people have said to me, well, hey man, it's just I am who I am, but I know where I'm going. Jesus is not your savior, death is. That he's lavished on us all grace and all kindness, that the power of the gospel changes us. A true and powerful gospel invites us into a, a constant union with God, not just a Sunday morning relationship, not just a Tuesday morning men's group, but a constant, daily, intimate relationship with Jesus. And we can walk with him and have victory in him. That that reality becomes the foundation that God wants to redeem us and change us. The problem is we've reduced the gospel down to praying a prayer so that we can go to heaven and we've lost sight of the power of the gospel to change lives. You see, it's not just a transformative for someone who's never believed, it's for God in us every day for us to live in the power of our righteousness. I get overwhelmed sometimes because I want you to be excited about Jesus. And I know for some of you, the reality is you don't think about Sunday until Saturday night, amen? I'm telling you, I'll go home today and I'll start thinking about next week. In fact, can I be honest with you? I was actually thinking about next week this morning in my office before prayer time. I'm already thinking about next Sunday because there's something in me that wants you to have the passion of Christ in you, not my passion, but to have the passion of Christ that you and I were made for joy, you and I were made for righteousness, you and I were made to be holy because of Jesus. It's foundational. You see, the word disciple is more than an acrostic of maturing. It's a relationship of surrendering to the king. It's a relationship of surrender. And just like in any marriage relationship or friendship, there are certain principles that are there. We don't have to spell it out because there's a relationship there that these things that we've looked at over these last few weeks should just be an overflow of our surrendering to the king. Should be an overflow. You see, the gospel is God's power with a purpose that he wants to be in relationship with us. And the purpose of God's power always has been and always will be the salvation of mankind, that we are separated from God, that God wants to redeem those who are lost and bring them into a relationship with him. It's what we call getting saved. Y'all remember that? Getting saved. 
It's a word that, that used to have power. And we would talk about, man, when were you saved? For many of us, we don't even use that word anymore. Because you see, that word saved is used to describe someone who's been rescued, that's been rescued from an eternity apart from God. That judicial penalty of sin that when sin entered the world, death entered into us. The penalty of sin is death. But that word saved means so much more than the penalty of death out there. In fact, when you look at that word, it speaks of God's rescue that delivers believers out of destruction and into his safety. You ever been safe? I'm telling you, it changes you, doesn't it? When you get safe. The word literally means to rescue, to deliver, to save, to bring health both physically and morally. It's more than just a promise living forever in heaven. Don't miss that. I'm not making a lot of that. Listen, I'm longing for that day. That's why we take communion, man, because we're longing for the day that Jesus will come back. Remembering the body, remembering the blood, man. I'm not making light of it, but I'm telling you, salvation is so much more than just eternity. It's now. It's now. There's a holistic thing to, to walk in with Jesus. It touches the body, the soul, and the spirit. Look at 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. Look at it. It says, may God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. I love that statement. Would you say those words with me? Through and through. That's pretty thorough, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, it kind of doesn't leave any ground, does it? May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, when God speaks of saving our spirits, the term justification is used. That we have been justified. The penalty of sin is now paid for. When he speaks of saving our souls, that's the term of sanctification. That God has not only declared us holy and righteous, he's also working out that salvation and we are working out that sanctification process in our journey. We are growing up into maturity. When he speaks of saving our bodies, that term is the glorified body, that one of these days that we are gonna be glorified, man. That's why we take communion. That's part of the reason we worship him is because we're longing for that day that he's gonna return and our bodies will be glorified in him. Amen? It's three parts, spirit, soul, mind, will, and emotions, our physical body. He promises to bring the spirit and the soul and the body in a place of righteousness, completely saved and removed from all the effects of sin on mankind. It's a thorough salvation that we have been saved from the penalty of sin, that we're saved from the power of sin. And one of these days, listen to me, we're gonna be saved from the presence of sin. It's a great salvation it's an incredible, and it all started because God loved us. Think about that. I think we forget that sometimes, don't we? That God loves us. And that, that salvation is available to all who believe. And listen, God doesn't partially save us. He doesn't just save us a little bit and sprinkle us here and there. Listen to me. You need to understand this, that he accomplished a sufficient work on the cross and his power is present and available at this moment to anyone who believes. And to summarize our salvation as only a life after death with no promise of freedom in this life is to grossly underestimate and misrepresent the power of God to bring real deliverance and transformation in our life on a daily believer's walk. That if that power can save us for eternity, that same power can also give us liberty and freedom today. <laughs> we've reduced salvation to an afterlife experience and we've left Christians without any hope. And that's where some of you are. You see, when the Bible speaks of salvation, it stresses that we are genuinely and powerfully saved from an enemy too strong for us to fight. 
In fact, if you go back into Exodus chapter 40, this is incredible. Love this story. Or Exodus chapter 14, excuse me. There's a dramatic and complete salvation we have can be compared to the story of the Israelites escaping Egypt. Now listen to me. So you may be here this morning and you may not believe all the Old Testament, okay? So let, let me say number one. I'm glad you're here and I'm not asking you to believe all of this, but I'm going to challenge you to listen to this because there is a powerful picture of what God does for us in our salvation. And even if you don't believe that God parted the Red Sea, I do because Jesus did, so I'm just going to say that. But I'm not asking you to just listen to the story of the powerful redemption and complete salvation. For 400 years, the people of God, Israel, worked as slaves under Pharaoh. 400 years, the leader of Egypt and they worked tirelessly making bricks, they, cruelty going on, all this stuff. And, and the Israelites literally just multiplied like bunnies. I'm telling you, there were just millions of them. And it was this entire workforce that Egypt had at the time. And I want you to observe very closely that God took his, his servant Moses and, and he raised up Moses to speak on their behalf. He spoke on their behalf and said, let my people go. You know what Pharaoh said? Nope. And you wouldn't either. That's your workforce. That's your economy. That's like going to, to Bezos at an Amazon and saying, let my people go. In other words... Get rid of everybody. Jeff Bezos would go, you are smoking crack. Because it would shut down all of y'all are like panicking. Oh my gosh, Amazon's closing. That's what's going on here. So God sent 10 plagues. Last plague finally broke his back and, and Israel was let go. It's an incredible story. They go out across the desert and they've been set free. Pharaoh's sitting back at the place going, what have I done? Go get them. And so they take off and they come to the Red Sea in this mountain and they're thinking, oh my gosh, where am I gonna go? What am I gonna do? And finally Moses calls out to God in Exodus 14, 15 and 16. Why do you cry out to me? God says, tell the Israelites to go forward, lift up your staff, stretch it out your hand over the sea and divide it. And the people of Israel may go through the sea on dry ground. And so Moses literally split the Red Sea. The children of Israel walked across as he lifted that staff. And here comes the largest formidable army of their day. They thought it was over. They get all the way through the Red Sea. And just when the Egyptian army gets right to the middle, God goes, Phew completely wipes them out. Everybody. Just like that. That's a pretty powerful salvation. Amen? I'm going to bring the story back to the gospel. Because see, instead of choosing an earthly vessel like Moses, God chose Jesus to be our deliverer. And in our story, Egypt's not our problem. Sin is. Sin is our problem. We inherited it from Adam. Go back and read Romans chapter 5. The condition, the condition of sin and death in the human heart enslaves us. And it's bringing death to us daily. But God did not leave us without a remedy. Jesus came into the earth to give his life for a ransom. To pay the price for you and I. Instead of leading us through the Red Sea, let me tell you what he did. He led us to his grave. The deepest, darkest place. And in that grave, here's what God does. He completely saves us. Because at the grave, he took sin. He became sin for us and died on a cross, taking sin to the grave and rose three days later. In that song you just sang, that's the whole point of the gospel is that he rose and he raises us from death into life. And sin no longer has a penalty for you. Sin no longer has power over you. The only power you give sin is what you give back to. It's what you submit to. You don't have to live in sin anymore. Oh, but the world says, Edward, we're just men and we can't help it. Yes, you can, because you're no longer who you used to be. You've been through the grave. The sin has been wiped out, man. Yes, you're still surrounded with the presence of sin, but it no longer has penalty or power over you. You see, there's something about the power of right believing. 
There's something about the power of believing that you have been made righteous. You are no longer stuck between a sinful state and the grave because Jesus rose from the grave and he gave you a new heart. And that's why we started, hey man, it starts with you and I realizing we are dead to our old self and we've been made new in Christ Jesus. You know, that's the first step in AANA, Celebrate Recovery, all of it, is to realize that you are powerless. And you'll accept that in those programs, but when a preacher starts preaching about it, you get offended. Ouch! There's something about dying and being risen in righteousness. By the cross, he destroyed sin and sickness and death by becoming sin and death so we could be forever liberated from the captivity of sin and become fully the righteousness of God. That's why scripture calls it born again or partakers of the divine nature. Isn't that good? That's who we are in Jesus. To understand that the gospel delivers us emphatically and permanently from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and one day the presence of sin. That's the gospel. That's why Jesus came so that we could be one with him. You see, God's purpose in saving us in such a powerful way is so that we could be intimate with him, so we could be in a relationship with him every day, walking with him. It's called the new covenant that we experience and grow up into the fullness of Jesus Christ to enjoy our salvation. When's the last time you enjoyed being safe? You go, well, Edward, I'm not safe. I know I'm saved, but it doesn't feel safe. Can I just tell you, that's why repentance is so important. You know, I grew up being taught that repentance is walking one way, stopping, turning, and walking the other way. It is that. But let me tell you what repentance is. It's changing your mind. Renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. Renewing your mind of the power of the gospel. You're not who you used to be. You've now been made new. You're no longer a sinner. You're now righteous. You're no longer someone that used to do that. You're now someone that's been made new. You've been given a new heart. He took your heart of stone and gave you a heart of flesh, man, that you've been made new. You're renewing your mind. You are repenting every day, getting up every day. I don't have to look at that porn. I don't have to go into debt. I don't have to do that because, listen, I've been made right. I'm no longer under the power or the penalty of sin, man. Now I've been made right in Jesus. And listen, Listen, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't necessarily feel right right now, but I'm going to continue to repent until I whip my mind into shape. As Paul said, like an athlete, man, I'm going to eventually know that every day I have been made right. Come on. Am I fired up? Yeah. I am fired up because I'm telling you, man, I, it, it, sometimes it burns in me to preach Sunday and wait another seven days. Because we have been saved. We are partakers of the divine nature of God. Think about that. (laughs) I just can't get over it. That we're completely new, free from the penalty of sin, free from the power of sin, and soon to be present, soon to be free from the presence of sin. (laughs) Let's go back to that prayer in John chapter 17. We'll go home. Y'all ready for this? John chapter 17, 6 through 8, Jesus is still praying. He says, I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of this world. They were yours. You gave them to me and they have obeyed your word. Verse seven, now that they know everything you have given me comes from you, for I gave them the words you gave me and they accepted them. (laughs) They knew with certainty that I came from you and they believed you sent me. Jesus is using some strong words here to describe his followers. He revealed himself to them and they what? Obeyed. It's not a word we like, is it? Let me, can I just say this? When Danielle and I started dating, she never had to use the word obey. Do you know that? Because I was in love with her. Didn't bother me a bit. In fact, that brand new Z71 I just bought, I gave it to her when we were dating. I don't recommend that, okay? So I'm... Um, <laughs> love you, honey. Um, She's watching on Facebook. I knew I loved her, man. I'd given her anything. And she never used that word 
Why? Because she gave me her heart. And God has revealed his heart to you through Jesus. That great salvation called the gospel. He's revealed himself to them and they obeyed. He's revealed himself to them and they accepted him as savior. Not just a good rabbi, not just a good man. He's the savior. He revealed himself to them and they believed. So let me ask you a question. Have you believed? Have you ever, I'm not asking if you've been to church. I'm not asking if you've been good. I'm asking if you believed on the revealed son of God, Jesus Christ, and become one with him. Is there evidence in your journey that you have died to self? And I'm not saying perfection, but I'm asking you, is there a direction in your journey that you've died to yourself daily? You're imitating Jesus. You're serving others. You're loving others. You're impacting people. There's a power and presence of the Holy Spirit and love, joy, peace, patience, kind of self-control and all those things are just flowing out of you, man. And there's, there's lasting fruit and there's something enduring about you. If that's not going on in you, then I'm telling you, examine your salvation. Examine your heart. Walk in the aisle does not save you. A life surrendered to Jesus Christ believing on his name, accepting him as savior, saves you. Not walking the aisle and saying a prayer. The words don't save you. It's in your heart. Have you been saved? That's why we're here. I would love, I would love if everybody in this room could confidently say what Jesus said about his followers. I've believed, I've accepted, and I'm willing to do whatever as the king of my life that he says. Have you believed? Do you have a relationship with Jesus Christ? Are you one with him? See, the gospel says that God will save you from the penalty of sin. He'll save you from the power of sin. And one of these days, he's going to save you from the presence of sin. But it's all based on what Jesus did at the cross. And three days later, rose again so that you and I could be saved. Let's pray together. So, Father, I love you. That this is eternal life. That we would know you, Jesus Christ, whom you sent. God, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the power of our salvation. And Father, I pray this morning that if there's someone here, Father, that's never surrendered their life to you, your word says in Romans 3 that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And there is none righteous, not even one. And God, we know that the wages of sin is death, that sin separates us. That's why you came. In Romans 5, you said that you demonstrated your love to us, that while we're sinners, Christ died for us so that we could be one with you. And Father, I thank you that you gave us a way to be saved. In Romans 10, you said that if we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we would be saved. It's in our heart that we believe unto righteousness. And with our mouth, confession is made for salvation. That whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So Father, I pray if there's somebody here this morning that's never done that, They've never confessed you, believed in their heart, that, God, you would give them courage right now, right as we end this, to pray this simple prayer. And if that's you this morning, every head bowed, every eye closed, and you've never done that, I want to invite you right now to pray this prayer with me. Father, just say it with me. Father, I know that I've broken your laws, and my sins have separated me from you. I am truly sorry. I confess and I want to turn away from my past sinful life towards you. Forgive me. I believe that your son, Jesus Christ, died for my sins, was resurrected from the dead, and is alive. I invite you to become the Lord of my life, to rule and to reign in my heart. 
Send your Holy Spirit to help me obey you. Be my king and my Lord. With every head bowed and every eye closed, if you prayed that prayer, would you just slip your hand up right now? All over this room, just slip it up. That today you're giving your life to Christ. Amen. I saw you in the back back there. Somebody else. You just say, man, I'm giving my life to Christ today. That great salvation. Anybody else going once, going twice. Now listen to me. If you raise your hand, I want to ask you to do something to your right. There's a place called Grace Place. And there's some folks there that would love to pray with you and encourage you. And maybe you just go over there this morning when we finish. And you would just say, man, I prayed that prayer. Maybe you're here this morning and you got some questions. And you still want to check Jesus out a little bit more. Number one, I'd say come back. This is a safe place. But number two, there's some folks that would love to pray with you and encourage you and answer your questions this morning. So don't leave this place. There's a place of grace in the back. It's to your right in the back corner. They'd love to pray with you and encourage you. And listen to me, believer. As we walk out of this place, you walk out with a great and powerful salvation. Walk in that power. You are no longer who you used to be. Now go and be Jesus in the world that you live in. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. And everybody said, amen. Have a great week. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you, have a great week.